Um, thank you very much. It, um, it is, in fact, a, a very great honour to be voted by the students to give a lecture like this. At, uh, I must admit I was quite touched. But for those members of the academic staff who didn't win the ballot, let me just tell you how it was that I did win the ballot. It wasn't by offering them drugs or anything, but I teach a very large number of students. I teach medical students, veterinary students, uh, dental students, and science students. So actually, if only 2% of my students like my lectures, that's a lot more than the guys lecturing in ancient Sanskrit get, because they only have two students in the class at the one time. Now, we're a little bit, um, I will have a difficulty with the, uh, the pointer. The laser pointers don't project on this screen, and uh, I like to tell you what you should be looking at. So I'm going to try and use this pointer, this high-tech pointer. Now, for those of you who want to learn a little bit about um, giving a lecture, uh, what I've just done is witter on for a little while so that you could all get used to my accent. Uh, and what hopefully in a few years' time you'll be able to call a foreign accent. <laughs> so, I hope you can still see me here, all right? But what I'm going to talk about today are a, a few aspects about drug abuse. The field of drug abuse is so enormous that actually um, I couldn't do it in, in five lectures, let alone one half-hour lecture. So I've picked out a few things that I think are quite topical, and I hope you, they're of interest to you. So, I'm a member of this group, uh, the Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs. And this is a group of, uh, I hesitate to say the word experts, but a group of people that work in the area of drug abuse. There are, there's a barrister, there's um, some scientists, there are psychiatrists, there are people who try to influence government policy, and so on. So, these are people from the sort of conservative side of society. This is not a group from the lunatic fringe. Um, it's a, a, a fairly conventional group. And um, they set out uh, to actually try to determine uh, or try to agree on how harmful individual drugs are uh, to people who take them and to society. So what you can see on this graph here, right, this score on this uh, y-axis here is actually a, a harm score. Now, we can argue all day about whether or not you can take harm and attribute numbers to it. All right? I don't want to get into that argument. What I want to think about is relative harm across this long list of drugs here. And in blue, what we have is the harm that this group of people thought all right, um, the, the drug would give to the person taking the drug. And in red is the harm to society. Now, the red bits are a bit difficult because obviously the harm to society uh, is determined by prevalence as well as uh, actual harm. So I want you to ignore the red bits and just look at the blue bits. And the first thing to point out here is that across all of these drugs, heroin, cocaine, tobacco, amphetamine, benzodiazepines and so on, right down to ecstasy, LSD and magic mushrooms, they're all thought to be harmful. So although I'll talk about whether or not drugs should be legal or illegal, we're starting from the standpoint that the drugs do produce some harm. But what we can see along here is that this group of people decided that some drugs were more harmful than others. Now, what I've done in this uh, diagram is to take the previous graph and now to color the columns in according to the way the government classified drugs. So, seriously harmful drugs are class A drugs, a less harmful B, class C, and then the green are things that are completely legal. Now, as we look along this list, we can see here that we have alcohol being very harmful, uh, but legal, and we have tobacco that's legal and, and still quite harmful. Now, we have to live with that, I think, because uh, alcohol, the Americans tried prohibition, and it didn't work. So it would be very difficult to, now to make alcohol illegal. And the government are making good inroads into reducing the amount of tobacco smoking. So we can excuse the fact that these are legal. Right? And then we have a group of drugs which are all thought to be very dangerous. Uh, heroin, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, cocaine itself. But what I'd like to point out to you 
is that there are drugs down here, methadone, ecstasy, LSD, and magic mushrooms, which this group of relatively sensible people all right, think are relatively, uh, are not, are, don't, aren't terribly harmful, but yet they're still class A drugs. And that is that if you're found with them in your possession, you're locked up and the key is thrown away. And what this implies to, to me all right, uh, is that government policy is not determined by scientific advice. Government policy is determined by getting re-elected. And getting re-elected is determined largely by the media. If we look on the Home Office website, it actually says that Class A drugs are considered to be the most likely to cause harm. Right? David Nutt, who used to be a professor of psychiatry here, only Bristol would have a professor of psychiatry called Nutt, right? um, he actually got the sack by the government for pointing out that you were actually as likely to die of ecstasy right, as you were falling off a horse. Right? That the current, uh, the current incidence of, of both is about the same. So, all of these drugs are harmful, uh, but the government doesn't seem to have a rational uh, classification of the harm. Uh, and that's, I think, something which uh, we need to try to uh, uh, redress, and something which I think scientists and um, <coughs> uh, people uh, have to uh, take up with the government. I just wanted to give you a, an example of how the media influence the way that drugs are classified. Some of you might remember these two young lads. Uh, they are from Scunthor, or they were from Scunthorpe. Unfortunately, they overdosed and died. They went out on a bender one day uh, on the 17th of, uh, of, of March in 2010. Now, within two hours of their bodies being found, the policeman in charge of the investigation appeared at a press conference that was televised nationally, if not internationally, and said that these two lads had died because they had taken mephedrone, the legal high. A couple of weeks later, Alan Johnson, the Home Secretary, announced that mephedrone would be made illegal within weeks. That statement was made independent of his own advisory committee on the misuse of drugs. They hadn't reported to him yet, but he said this drug is going to be made illegal. And in fact, a few days later, Mephedrone was made illegal. Subsequently, when we get the toxicology reports, it's discovered that these boys hadn't taken mephedrone at all. They had, in fact, taken methadone. But somebody had overheard them in the pub saying methadone, and had, because mephedrone was in the press, had misheard. And that's why these articles, Mau Mau is the uh, street name for mephedrone, this is why it was given the blame for these. And this is not an isolated case. There was another case uh, a few months just before that where a girl in Brighton died on a night out uh, clubbing. And again, it was all down to Mau Mau, all right? and this mephedrone was a nasty substance. Subsequently, all right, it was proven that she had no drugs in her body all right, and had actually died of a lung infection. So I just flag this up that really, you know, it's the media that determine government policy, not good, sound scientific advice. <laughs> now, I have a, a friend in, in Glasgow who's a bit of a stamp collector. All right? um, and what he did was he looked in the newspapers in Scotland uh, for a whole year, and he cut out every article uh, that had been published about someone dying from a drug overdose. So he had a pile of paper about this high. Then he went to the Scottish Records Office, Gross, right, and he examined all of the records of people who died suddenly and worked out whether or not a drug had been involved at all. So that could be they'd taken a drug and walked outside and got knocked down by a bus. It didn't actually mean that the drug had killed them, but he, he was very inclusive. And then he tried to match up the deaths from, uh, notified by the government to what was notified in the press. And what I've highlighted here in, in yellow, you can see that there were 28 deaths all right, in which ecstasy was implicated in some way. 26 of them were reported in the press. 
So there's an approximately one-to-one -one ratio of ecstasy death to publicity in the media. If you look at cocaine, roughly the same number, but only four of them were reported in the press. If we come down to heroin, a larger number of deaths, all right, but a much smaller proportion of uh, reporting. The ratio is now five to one. It is, in fact, no wonder that people think ecstasy is a very uh, deadly substance, because every time somebody dies of it, of, like, when they're using it, it's reported in the press. When it's heroin addicts, because we actually have to add the heroin, the methadone, the morphine all together, and you can see here that this gets up to well over a thousand, the ratio of reporting all right, actually, uh, dramatically increases. That is that almost none of the deaths are reported in the press, all right, but, they're all, but they've been recorded uh, by the government. <coughs> so there's a, a mismatch. But it is reporting in the press which determines government policy because governments have to be re-elected. Now, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about legal highs. Now, originally, the term legal highs was coined um, to describe herbal alternatives to legal drugs. And um, you'll have to excuse me here, but um, when I talk to my students about herbal remedies, I have a rant, all right? and I wasn't going to do it, but I've decided we're going to have a rant anyway, all right? because it's very rare do I get the opportunity to rant to a big group of people. But there is this feeling in society that anything which is herbal, brackets natural, must be good. And anything which a scientist like myself develops, a chemical, must be bad. So yesterday, when I gave this lecture to the medical students, I suggested that on Friday when we meet again, I'd bring in bits of my laburnum tree and they could all chew it, all right? And then they could all die because the laburnum tree contains poisons. And actually, there are things in nature that are nasty and there are things in nature that are good. And exactly the same thing applies to science and the pharmaceutical industry, all right? Some things we develop are very good and some things aren't quite so good. But it's not that we should all be down at the herbal remedy shop and everything would be better, all right? Uh, science actually does know what it's doing. So initially, herbal highs, herbal remedies are, 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 were, were, were legal highs, but subsequently, legal high, the term legal high, is now used to define any substance that is not illegal. And these are now purchased uh, online from outside the United, United Kingdom. It's very easy. You just uh, click on a, a website, and they'll sell you a kilogram uh, under the heading Research Chemical Not for Human Use. And it's immediately shipped from some uh, site outside of the United, Sta out United Kingdom, and it's available for you to take. And in 2010, it was estimated that there were 41 new small molecule legal highs in the United Kingdom and an additional 47 synthetic cannabinoid drugs. Now, this number may appear large to you, but actually the people supplying these are not stupid. They're not supplying everything they've got. What they're waiting for is these to be made illegal by the government, and then they're going to supply another one then another one, then another one. So the legal highs are going to keep coming. And they are actually now all small molecular changes to uh, uh, traditional drugs. So I'd like to propose that instead of using the term legal high, we may well use the term not yet illegal high, or novel psychoactive substance, or the term an untested chemical. Now, mephedrone was the legal high that I've mentioned already. There's another one now on the street called PMA. Um, in case there are any biochemists here, this is not a formal ester. This is another molecule that's called PMA. And within this dotted line here, this is the structure of amphetamine. If you put this CH3 group on, that becomes methamphetamine. And if you put this funny ring on here, it becomes ecstasy. So by changing this molecule's structure a little bit, you get different effects. Amphetamine and methamphetamine 
work on the brain by interacting with dopaminergic neurons, and ecstasy works by interacting with neurons that contain serotonin or 5-HT. So these molecules are now all illegal. Ecstasy is class A, amphetamine is class B. Methadrone is really just methamphetamine with this ketone here and an HC, a CH3 grouping here. So methadrone is a molecule very like uh, amphetamine, and so is PMA. PMA is just amphetamine here and this bit stuck on the end. But we can't predict how they work, right? because changing the chemical structure may actually change uh, their activity. And, and bizarrely, the Home Office are not interested <coughs> in working out what these molecules do. Right? There are various labs in, in universities in, in the United Kingdom that could take this molecule today and test it. Right? And we'd know everything about it. But actually, um, the Home Office don't really want us to do that. Uh, they just want to wait until um, two or three years down the line before uh, they will consider it. Now, in terms of the pharmaceutical industry trying to develop a drug, then it goes through a number of stages. So, first of all, the drug is made, then it's tested on models, it goes into preclinical development, where you, there's pre preliminary toxicology testing, then it's tried in humans, uh, volunteers, then in phase two, you get long-term toxicology testing, phase three, regulatory approval, and then the drug is finally approved for use. And even with this long process here, all right, we get some mistakes. Drugs like Vioxx get through, which we subsequently discover have some problems. But in contrast, the development of a legal high, the drug is synthesized nowadays in some foreign country, all right, and then it's immediately uh, shipped and sold for use. And, and in clubs now, people don't take an ecstasy tablet that's got an E on it. All right? There's a bag of white powder, you lick your finger, you dip it in, and you suck it. And you keep doing that until you want to stop. And I think this is very dangerous. Now, you might think that being a relatively old fuddy-duddy, that I'm just scaremongering, but being a relatively old fuddy-duddy, I can actually remember things that happened in the past. And in 1982, a PhD student all right, tried to make some, an opiate, a pethidine analogue, and he made a mistake in the synthesis. And what he actually made was uh, this molecule, MPTP. So opiate addicts injected themselves with this. In the brain, it's metabolised to MPP+. Plus. That destroys the neurons in the brain that use dopamine, and uh, about 20 people ended up with irreversible Parkinsonism. And that was recorded in this book, The Case of the Frozen Addicts. So uh, anyone who's uh, thinking of going out on Friday clubbing and uh, taking a legal high that they don't know what it is, I would just uh, recommend that they remember this. Now, what I want to do for a few minutes is uh, talk about why people take drugs. And there are a number of reasons why people take drugs. Uh, we probably all think that people take drugs to feel good. That is, that the drugs will induce euphoria or self-confidence or the like. But some people actually take drugs to feel better. That is, that they start from a position of being anxious or depressed. And they are taking the drugs to try to improve their feelings. Right? And these people we would call the self-medicators. You and I, I think, would probably fall into this group if we decided to take a drug, all right? And I'm sure that when I have a glass of wine tonight, I'll be trying to feel good. I hope it's not to feel better. <laughs> In addition to these, all right, why do people start taking drugs? Well, there's curiosity and peer pressure. And sometimes after a period of taking drugs, people lose control of taking the drug. It's just be, it becomes a compulsive uh, behavior. Now, <coughs> I want to just mention impulsivity for a few minutes. Uh, impulsivity is uh, when people do things without thinking of the consequences. And impulsivity may actually be involved in a large number of uh, disorders, 
all right, uh, that we have. But I think it's, uh, there's good evidence now that it may also uh, be involved in, in drug abuse or play a role in drug abuse. And this study uh, comes from work out of the, a laboratory in Cambridge, but Emma Robinson, who works in Bristol, was part of this work uh, while she was on sabbatical there. And what they had in psychology in Cambridge was they had a test where the animals would get a signal, and then they had been trained to wait a little while, and then they had to do something. So the important bit of this was the signal, then a delay, and then do something. Go look for a reward. But their experiments kept getting messed up because a lot of the rats would be trained and behave normally, but some of them, little buggers, they wouldn't wait. They'd always just go straight away, all right? And someone quite clever, for, for years these were just the problem rats, but someone quite clever had the idea of separating them out, all right? And these became the high impulsive rats. So they have low impulsive rats and high impulsive rats. If you measure the dopamine receptor level in the striatum of these two types of rats, and high level of receptors is by the warm color, then the low impulsive, what I would probably call normal, but I might, that might be wrong, but the normal sort of people have a high level of D2 dopamine receptors, whereas the highly impulsive rats have a low level of receptors. So maybe impulsivity, there's a, 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 an underlying um, biological uh, reason for that, a low level of dopamine D2 receptors in the, in the brain. But then they did a very interesting experiment. They allowed these rats to self-administer cocaine. So this is time, and this is the amount of time that they gave themselves a shot of cocaine. And the impulsive rats gave themselves much more cocaine than the standard rats. And so it may well be that impulsivity is a, is, is, a, is a big influence on why rats, and maybe even humans, um, go on to take drugs. Oops, sorry. Now, is there any evidence for such things in, in humans? Well, uh, a long time ago, Nora Volkow had actually also measured the level of D2 receptors in the brain, uh, but she had looked at normal people all right, and people who had a history of cocaine abuse. And again, you found that there's less uh, D2 receptors here than there are there. But at the time she did her studies, she couldn't um, differentiate between this had been the effect of chronically taking the drug. But the rat studies might imply that actually the cocaine users start out with a lower level of receptors. Now, don't rush out and tell your friends that I said, all right, drug taking has got a genetic basis. I didn't mention the word gene once while I was describing that, all right? This difference in receptor number could be something, or could be due to something which happens after birth. Right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a genetic uh, influence, but it might well mean that people become predisposed to taking drugs because of some condition in their central nervous system. Now, for many drugs, cocaine and heroin and the like, the reason people take the drug is to get euphoria, a big buzz. And in science, we talk about euphoria and we also talk about reward. The reason we talk about reward is that we do a lot of our experiments using animal models. And this little chap here, all right, is, every time he presses this lever, he gets a shot of the green drug into his brain. Now, mice, rats, and monkeys will learn to do this fairly rapidly, all right? and on a Friday night, they actually come across and press the lever too often, and they actually overdose and die. So what you have to do is produce, put some limitations on this experiment, so what you can actually do is the animal will only get a shot of the drug if the red light is on. And what you'll see is that this chap will sit over here, all right? he'll sit waiting for hours upon end, watching the light. When the light goes on, he'll run across and he'll press the pedal. And you can actually make it that he will have to press the pedal a hundred times for one shot of cocaine. 
But he will do it because he likes that effect of cocaine. And that's why we call it rewarding. And we can't say it's euphoric because rats don't smile. Right. So, what we can also do then is make this experiment a little bit more sophisticated and put this cannula into specific parts of the brain and have a very fine tip so that we actually can find out which part of the brain did the animal want the drug in. And this is a human brain seen sort of side on, right? And I want to talk about neurons that sit in an area of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And these neurons project up to an area called the nucleus accumbens. <laughs> and rats will lever press to put heroin, all right, into their ventral tegmental area. And they don't really like cocaine and amphetamine down there. All right, they prefer heroin down there, but they'll lever press for cocaine and amphetamine up here in the nerve terminal regions. Now, in both cases, well, heroin will excite these nerves and we'll get a big release of dopamine, the neurotransmitter, and cocaine and amphetamine will work up here all right, to stop the dopamine being taken away so the levels of dopamine all right, here are much higher. So we can actually think that these animals are lever pressing or to, uh, to put drugs either into the VTA or into the nucleus accumbens. And what they really want is a big release of dopamine within the nucleus accumbens. So here are some experimental traces where people have uh, given animals amphetamine, cocaine, morphine, or ethanol. And what they've done is actually measure the amount of uh, dopamine in the synaptic cleft in the nucleus accumbens. And here amphetamine caused a great big rush of dopamine, cocaine the same, morphine and ethanol. So all these drugs produce euphoria and they all give us a big rise in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So to some extent we can think of the dopaminergic pathway from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens as being a reward pathway. All right? And that euphoria, initially at least, is because we've got a big amount of dopamine released into the synaptic cleft. Now, jokingly in my lectures, but actually I'm not sure I am joking having said it for about 10 years now, is I want to be one of the people that volunteers to get a set of electrodes implanted there. Right? Because if I take heroin or cocaine or amphetamine, I'm breaking the law. All right? But if I had a little device that just stimulated these nerves and released dopamine up here, I could get just as much euphoria, all right? but I wouldn't be breaking the law. So uh, maybe that's the way to go. Now, <coughs> why should drugs of, uh, that, that induce euphoria give us such a big rise in dopamine, all right? Is the pathway from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens just waiting there for you or I to take a drug? Well, obviously not, right? It's there because it also responds to natural rewards, all right? Food, water, sex, looking after young. All of these behaviors give us a rise in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. And so here you can see a similar experiment to the drug experiment, the amount of dopamine being released in the nucleus accumbens. But in this instance, all right, it's a male rat, and suddenly a female is brought in, and you get a rise in dopamine. Then they start to copulate, and you get a bigger rise in dopamine. So this is the pleasure that's associated all right, with having sex. If you have a rat at home, or if you come into the lab and see some of our rats, all right, if you just have a little piece of Mars bar and stick it through the bars of the cage, the rats will just absolutely devour it. So rats love a little bit of chocolate. And in this experiment here, very similar again, dopamine being released, all right, uh, they gave the rat some uh, pleasant food, and again, there's a big rise in the release of dopamine. So pleasure, to me, is chemical. All right? To you, pleasure might be an emotion, but to me, chemical is just a lot of dopamine in the synaptic cleft 
activating the D2 receptors. Not terribly romantic, but actually it's true. Now, for, for many drugs, people become addicted to them. What we've been talking about up until now has been um, why people take them initially. But with chronic uh, taking of drugs, then what we find is people become dependent upon them. And in dependence, there are two components. There's psychological dependence, right, where you may crave the drug, right, and there's physical dependence, which is that if you stop taking the drug, you go into a withdrawal syndrome. <laughs> now, yesterday with the medical students, I asked them if anyone had ever seen a Kojak movie, and not one of the students had ever heard of Kojak, which just made me feel incredibly old. But those of you who are, are as old as I am will remember in, in the Kojak movies, they would, they would find a suspect, all right, or somebody with information, and they would be a heroin addict. And so they'd say, if you don't spill the beans, we're going to put you in the slammer and you're going to go into withdrawal. Right. So the guy doesn't spill the beans, so they put him in the slammer and half an hour later, an hour, they're screaming to be let out because they want another dose of the drug and they'll confess to anything. <laughs> so, because I had watched too many Kojak movies, I actually thought that physical uh, dependence, all right, the fact that if you didn't take the drug, you'd go into withdrawal, that this was the major driving influence in an addict to take the drug again. That addicts were scared to go into withdrawal. Well, that's not actually true. Right? The withdrawal syndrome is unpleasant, and it is a cue to make them think about taking the drug again. But actually, the major drive for drug dependence or drug addiction is the craving that the drug induces, the desire to have the pleasurable experience again. And in this graph here, what I'm trying to show you is that people who've gone into detox clinics and have gone through withdrawal, right, um, they don't all go back out and stay drug-free forever. In fact, most of them go back onto the drug. And nowadays, if you're a heroin addict, we can take um, them and, and give them some other drugs, of some benzodiazepines, a bit of clonidine, and some careful, uh, nice food and so on. And going through opiate withdrawal is about two weeks of serious flu. It's maybe a little bit worse than that, but it's not a life-threatening uh, disorder. So, People who go into treatment programs go through um, withdrawal. They go through a, pr a, a process of care. They go through uh, a, a lot of uh, psychological counseling and so on. All right? But if you look at the time after they detox, all right, then the number or the, per the percentage of people who are still drug-free drops dramatically. So that six, uh, six months after leaving the clinic, all right, these people, are, uh, there's only 20% of the people who are still drug free. 80% of them went back onto the drug. So that has to mean that going through the withdrawal syndrome is not the major driver for taking the drug. It's their craving to take the drug again. Now, if this rise in dopamine is the only thing that gives you the euphoria. Why do people crave the drugs but not really crave sex uh, and water, uh, food and water? Well, the explanation for that is uh, that it does appear that drugs enhance the memory of the experience. So not only do you get the effect of the drug, the, the buzz, the euphoria, what you also get is that memory of the experience, which is, and the memory is more intense of the drug than it is of other behaviors. So, how do drugs lay down uh, the memory, or drugs of abuse lay down the memory? Well, there is a process in the brain called long-term potentiation. And actually, if you go around the world and ask people what Bristol is most famous for in neuroscience, they'll tell you it's the place where they study long-term potentiation because my colleagues in uh, the Synaptic Plasticity uh, Center have made a, a, a major study of this. And the basic idea is that 
If you activate nerves, all right, then the nerves that are activated have a memory. All right? And that memory is laid down by the process called long-term potentiation. So what we have here are nerve endings coming in, and these are little packets of the neurotransmitter, probably glutamate. And they are then synapsing onto this postsynaptic cell. And the postsynaptic cell has some receptors on the membrane, but it's got some in store uh, at the site. And normally, if I stimulated these nerves, then I'd get this nice response because the transmitter has activated the receptors. If I just give a blast of stimuli, right, not very long, could only, may even just be a few seconds, all right, and then start giving the same stimulus again that gave that before, what you actually see is a much bigger response, the potentiation. And this is shown in a cartoon form here that the amplitude of these is here before. At this point, a conditioning stimulus is given, and then everything is raised up, and that's long-term potentiation. And it can go on here, it says minutes, but it can go on for days, um, weeks. And one of the, the underlying mechanism of this is that the uh, cell has put more receptors on the membrane. There's been an adaption uh, by the cell caused by the conditioning stimulus. Now, in terms of drugs, this is a slightly complicated slide. I don't really want to explain it too much. But if you give a rat a single dose of cocaine, all right, then what you get is a marked increase in synaptic strength. All right, a marked, a similar phenomenon to long-term potentiation. So this is a naive animal, an animal given saline, and an animal given cocaine. And what actually has happened is that by giving them the cocaine, we've markedly potentiated the uh, synaptic strength here. And that's probably what underlies the memory of these drugs. And this enhancement of, of LTP that's seen with cocaine is also seen with drugs like morphine, nicotine, and, and ethanol, drugs that people become very addicted to. You don't see this kind of potentiation with a drug like Prozac or any of the benzodiazepines like Librium and Valium. So it would appear that drugs that induce euphoria do something to give you the euphoria, big rise in dopamine release, but in addition, they also do something to your memory. And it's that long-term memory that makes you crave the drug years later because in your head, you still have the experience of the drug. Okay, I'm going to finish now, but before I finish, I thought I'd just take an opportunity to acknowledge that uh, in my career, there were two uh, very major influences. The first was a school teacher, Felix Lockery, uh, who was my science teacher. Uh, I don't have a photograph of uh, Mr. Lockery, but what I do have is this cartoon, because when I was at school, he was a newly qualified teacher, and he was a teddy boy, and he had a scooter, and, we, and he took the school football team, and we thought he walked on water. We thought he was just the best thing on earth. He actually one day belted our entire class. All right? I'm old enough to have had to suffer corporal punishment, but he belted the entire class because his scooter had broken down, and he was late, and he was on a last warning from the headmaster that he would lose his job if he was ever late. All right? And he, we were in the classroom, and we were making an incredible racket. All right? And so the headmaster found out. So he took out his, uh, his anger on us by belting us. All right? We got our revenge because um, a few weeks later, we discovered his keys on the desk. And so we, while inside uh, the classroom, locked the door and so that he was on the outside when he came and couldn't get in. And so he and the other science teacher went off uh, to the, uh, the storeroom and got a Crips apparatus and pumped hydrogen sulfide in through um, the keyhole. Now, you may have hydrogen, for those of you who don't know, hydrogen sulfide is uh, stink bombs, all right? What you all probably don't realize is that nowadays, health and safety consider hydrogen sulfide to be a deadly gas, all right? Well, I can tell you that there are 40 guys in Scotland that survived long exposure to hydrogen sulfide. But anyway, when I finished school, I had no other op uh, um, wish in life 
other than to be a scientist and to teach as he did. And so I owe him quite a lot. Thereafter, I did a PhD in the lab of Hans Kostelitz in the University of Aberdeen. Uh, he led the team that discovered all of these. He had a very distinguished scientific career, most of it between the age of 60 and, uh, and 85. But the one thing I'd like to stress about Hans Kostelitz was that he was an inspirational teacher, and actually he liked young people. He would, he would always turn to the young guys in the lab and ask us what we thought, and this gave us a great deal of confidence to go on and be scientists. And I would just like to thank both of them. Thank you very much. <laughs>